Good midday. Good evening. Nice streaming. Nice to see all of you trickling in to the webinar today. Um, my name is Amber Trout from Community Science. I'm totally excited to be your host today and journey person to host our discussion about equitable change management. Definitely, um, this picture definitely speaks how I feel sometimes where I get to the top of the stairs. I'm like, man, there's still more to go. And so we're excited to, to be here with part of what we hope to do today with uh, is really share what is the evidence and practice-based strategies we've heard. We like to say to move an organization through, through that equitable change, be it your end goal, having equity be explicit in that strategy or equity as the vehicle, that lens that you see all the pieces of your organization. And how do you manage equity in the different political moments, environmental moments to keep things moving through. And then shout out to y'all that spoke to us before this webinar. We hear you. We heard, please, not a one-on-one, give us concrete. How do we move through? How is it strategic? How do I connect my values to the system change? How do I talk to, speak to staff commitment when it feels like maybe the staff are moving faster than the leadership team? But there's buy-in on the leadership team, but it's unclear how to operationalize. We will do our best. That is our goal today, is really to talk about the how-to uh, to when you once you have that equity commitment or statement, or you say we're doing it, how do you go from your current state to where you'd like to go? But before we jump in, I want to say welcome to new friends that might, this might be your first community science webinar. So we're so excited you're joining us. Just wanted to share this is community science. This is all the lovely faces and social scientists and facilitators and practitioners uh, that are that make who we are and make our heartbeat. We're a research and evaluation and strategy firm. Uh, really, we see how do we help get that data to support the community voice, get the change they see. And so really we, our motto is how do we roar towards equity in every moment. And for us, the uh, organizational effectiveness team who you see in the lovely screens with me right now is how do we see organizations as that unit of change, that living organism that exists in an ecosystem that can push and create that demand and that shift for equitable change. So why are we here? Before we bring our panelists in, we wanted to share that generally in the literature, it looks so easy. Stages of change. I build awareness. I get some information. I get organized. I understand what policies I want to change. I implement that change. And then I sustain it. We know that's not the actual experience. To really have, what is my current state to go to my desired state? Rarely feels like that. Who's been on a road trip where you really thought you saw, thought that was the on-ramp, and the next thing you know, you're going the wrong direction? That's part of the journey that we love so much, but sometimes an organization can really uh, induce fatigue or lack of clarity. But that's okay. Because we really see organization change as a compass. Where do you want to go? So with those stages of change, it's really a roadmap of on-ramps to get to that desired state. And so what we'd like to share today is, first off, how are you honest with what your current state is? What's really going on? Can I look at myself, my organization, how we make decisions? And where do we wanna go? What is the desired state? And does that make sense for our organization? And so although this looks linear, this is just the limitation of my drawing. We know that it goes right, left, up, down, maybe a couple do -si dos. And then once you feel like you got that, how do you do this change in the external uh, context that your organization exists and the histories? Because those histories in your community are the histories that are going to be in the people that make up your organization. And then considering, well, what's the organizational context? Why was the organization created in the first place? What was its purpose? Is it still meeting that purpose? And what's the history of the organization, not only with the staff, but with the community and the ecosystems and partnerships it's been in? Lastly, we know when you're trying to 
change your organization state to advance equity or have equity throughout your policies, practices, and how you see the world is building that capacity. And what's interesting is all of that work, and you could see, so you're building awareness, you're getting organized, you have this compass that's telling you where you want to go. You start implementation. We even we haven't even mentioned when do you start seeing the changes you hope to see. This is sure a lot of effort before you get to that ultimate impact. So we share all that to say is oftentimes when we're working with organizations, we notice there's this desired state that everyone's working towards it. I want to be equitable um, in my community for food outcomes or for educational. And it's the highest form of equity. And for us, when you're getting started and thinking about those stages of change, so is your equity, what you can achieve in terms of what equity looks like along the stages of change. So as you're surfacing, you really understand what, what is the history? How do I acknowledge those impacts? and then use those most impacted by my organization's decisions or within the organization to identify what are potential solutions and metrics. Then equity is defining with the people and thinking about what are the measurements that make sense for this organization and the ecosystems it's part of, then how do we build? Each layer grows into that commitment. We have a tree here, but for us, it's not a single tree. And it's really about those roots and how those roots connect to other trees to really communicate with each other and to really make sure equity is not only enterprise-wide, but shows up in your partnerships and how you can have shared agendas with others. And most importantly, in addition to the time and the, and the commitment, the moral commitment, there's a financial commitment. All these components are what's needed to get to that desired state. But still now, it even sounds a little bit easier than what it feels like when you experience it. So I'm excited to bring the panelists. I don't know about you all, but I'm not sure it goes just like that. So Jasmine, do you mind introducing yourself and sharing a couple opening thoughts about uh, equitable change and what that means to you when an organization's like, hey, I'm trying to get to somewhere, but I, I just I can't figure it out. Oh, thanks, Amber. Um, as she mentioned, I am Jasmine Williams Washington. I'm really excited to be here with you all and with my colleagues to chat with you about what it takes to get equitable change, to drive equitable change in an organization. For me, as someone who spent many years as a community organizer, um, organizing in spaces, in places that I'm not a part of, right? So being an outsider coming in, I have a very a deepened understanding of the levers, the various levers to organization change from my experience in organizing. So the first thing is focusing on getting it right and not being right. You may come to this, this process and you may have that thing in mind that you want, the, that, it's that desired state that you want to be, but maybe it's not right now, right? So not wanting to be right, but getting it right, getting it right for the organization, right? The other thing is the, the ability to be able to manage and navigate um, the resistance that will come because this is a change process, okay? And with change, there is resistance. So uh, as Amber mentioned earlier, there is the desired state. And in my experience, organizations tend to have that desired state in mind that can be fuzzy. It's not exactly clear. Um, and this process and the effort and that those on ramps is really a, um, a part of aligning the intentions of the efforts with the actions that you need to take for the organization. So really getting into alignment. And we do that by asking questions of ourselves and of our other leadership team, right? But before we can even get there, we have to really be honest with ourselves to Amber's point, how far are you willing to go? And how far can you go considering your context, the organization's context, okay? So when I say how far can you go, how far are you willing to go? What do I mean by that? For leaders of uh, efforts such as this, it means, hey, are you ready? Are you ready to actually receive feedback and to sit in a place of learning um, and reflection, right? 
understanding that your desired state or that aspiration where you would like to carry your organization may not be the right um, the right move for the organization, or maybe it won't happen at the rate and at the pace that you feel or you would like it to actually happen, right? And then again, thinking about the organization, you have to be realistic about, again, the current state. What can you do being realistic about the role of the organization inside of this equitable change process, right? What do you, what does the organization actually have control over outside of or in the, with the political factors um, included? Because what we do know in our experience about doing this work is that nothing is apolitical, nothing. So whether you are a government agency, uh, federal or local, um, phil a philanthropic organization or nonprofit, there are always political considerations. And when considering how far um, are you willing to go? How far can you go? How far do you want to go? All of those things matter inside of uh, this process. The other thing I mentioned to y'all, you know, I was an organizer. So I sit in doing things with people and not to people. In my experience, things are sustained things carry through, things are transformative when people are a part of the process. People make up your organization, people are gonna be impacted by whatever change, um, um, change, organizational change process that you all embark on, right? And with change comes resistant behaviors. I want to say with change, we will become um, come resistant behaviors. What do I mean by that? First of all, Resistance happens, right? It's not if, it's when. It's not if, it's when, right? And that path, those on-ramps that Amber shared earlier is a way to get ahead of those, some of that resistance that you may meet along the way. So if we're on a road trip, maybe it's this number of speed bumps that you're gonna hit along the way, okay? So we wanna make it as, as smooth as possible. But again, resistance, is natural when change happens. It is a natural thing. But how can we get in front of those things? So in addition to those on-ramps and that uh, route that you're taking, it's about the pacing of your change process, right? If we move too fast, right? People are not able to get, get their, hey, pack their bags. I didn't get to uh, pack my snack bag that I need to take on this road trip that we're going on, the things that I need to show up and, and uh, have the, uh, and engage. Or I wasn't able to ask, ask Amber all of the questions, you know, will I have access? Can we talk about these things? Are things being shared with me? If the pace of the change process is too fast, right? But again, we wanna do things with people and not to people. So what if we slowed it down a little bit, slowed down our change process just a little bit and we give, we have more time. So we slowed it down, people have time to ask their questions. What is on my packing list? What should, how long is this road trip gonna be? You know, by when will we get to Bucky's? I love Bucky's. If y'all go on a road trip, go to Bucky's. Best bathrooms ever. You won't regret it, trust me, okay? But they're able to get out questions, right? Because again, change, change is hard no matter what type of change it is, okay? People need to be able to ask, ask questions. And also, back to an earlier point, not wanting to be right, not wanting to have all the answers, but getting the right pacing, the right thing for the organization. Because when we pause and we slow down and we listen, and we listen, that insight that came from what we saw as a resistant, right, resistant behavior, it's actually an opportunity for us to be clear about our final destination. Or maybe it's not the final destination. Maybe it's just the first pit stop along, uh, along our road trip. Because ultimately, maybe again, considering pacing, we may not be able to run that race and get to the final destination in that first six months. Maybe it won't be in 12 months. Heck, maybe it won't be in 18 months. The point is, this process goes at the, the pace of folks trusting the process. And trust is earned, not given. 
right? And we do those things and we build trust along the way by being transparency, by bringing people along with us inside the process. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, but what I would like to say, ultimately, the goal is to make impactful change, to be transformative, okay? Again, to be transformative, to be transformative and to sustain the change that we work toward, right? And I'm gonna pause and with that, I'm gonna send it over to my colleague, Zeke. Thanks, Jasmine. Uh, it is about transformation and um, I'm, I'm happy to be here as part uh, with, with you all and uh, 100 of you, right? Over 100 and there were, there were double that number uh, who actually signed up. So it's important to know that we are, we are you know, part of this larger group that is trying to figure out, you know, transformative change. And when we're talking about equity, equity, it always is about transformative change. So uh, this is my favorite conversation. Uh, and uh, as I have um, been part of and have been tasked to lead several different transformative change efforts catalyzed by commitment to equity, what I found is that I'm, I'm actually deeply oriented to the cycle of transformation. Uh, and something that feels uh, natural, actually. Uh, but I think I think that's actually true of all of us. Uh, I think that we are actually all oriented to the cycle of transformation, and uh, we can think about these experiences from our own lives, uh, where you have, you have shifted from something to another way of being. And I think those cycles that, that we've gone through uh, as individuals are really helpful through this process. Uh, so in those moments where you might feel stuck. Um, important to name, like, you know, where are we trying to get from to? I think of a, it's a helpful little tool to think about transformation as a from to sequence and to engage you know, on your own and or with, uh, with your colleagues and saying, where are we trying to get from and to? So uh, I think we can all be more grounded in transformation instead of potentially feeling like this is something that, that we don't know. We actually, we, we do know these cycles. Um, and so when we think about the transformations that we've experienced as individuals, I know that we all know that uh, there are moments of real darkness. Uh, there are moments when we feel lost. And so, um, you know, in moments when you're lost, really important to like slow down as you're doing here, right? And reaching out for, for support, right? And whether that's at your own organization, in your community, or with, with people like here at Community Science, yes, reach out for support. Um, and, and that is part of the process of getting through it. Um, but the more you've done it, the more you've completed these cycles of change, the more that you know what it takes to get through those moments. Um, so uh, when we're talking about stuckness on these journeys, um, what I found and, and um, you know, maybe what's drawing over 200 people to this kind of conversation is that it does seem like there are potentially more, more ways than ever to get stuck. Uh, and um, so I want to spend a minute on that and thinking about that uh, when we when we talk about being stuck or frozen or whatever, you know, whatever drew you into this conversation, um, to, uh, when I think of it in terms of a, a cycle of change, I think of it as the, the status quo working, uh, as, as it was designed to work. And because always equity is a cycle of, of change. It is a cycle to disrupt and to create something, you know, something new and different. So when we see that these uh, processes are, um, when we feel like we're stuck, we, it's important, a question to ask is like, well, who is being served when I'm feeling stuck? Because the, uh, the, the, the system is, is operating, the status quo is operating. Uh, and so when we think of uh, stuckness viewed this way, we can think of it as um, uh, there's, there's always new ways to get stuck because it is a response, a backlash to our progress. And so I just think of you know, one of one of the latest ways to give um, for us to get stuck is potentially you know what I believe we're seeing is potentially in some ways an overreaction to the Supreme Court decision on affirmative action. We're seeing that that actually is having an effect uh, potentially more broadly uh, than it needs to, um, and uh, and so I do align with these voices that I'm reading about who are saying uh, no, let's uh, this is the moment to actually you know double down to actually reinforce our commitment to equity as we're seeing the, the backlash um, take shape. Uh, so it's important for you to know, potentially be more vocal, right? As opposed to being on your own when you're stuck, right? Because then you can potentially see like, oh, I'm actually part of this broader thing, uh, a bigger stuckness than, than I might've known otherwise. Uh, on this issue of getting stuck, um, 
I've, I've recently had a, a newer reaction to it because uh, in my own community here in Southwest Michigan, that's where I'm based, um, we've uh, th there's been a, a 40 year effort to address the black infant mortality right here. Uh, and um, I was at a presentation where uh, one of the leaders was showing that actually 20 years ago, uh, the rates were nearly equal, black and white infant mortality, nearly equal in my community. And this was after two decades of work. Uh, and um, and now 20 years later, these rates are back up to uh, where they were 40 years ago. Uh, and so uh, when you know, had to ask that question in, in the moment, like what happened in the community at that, at that moment? And uh, the person presenting said, well, a lot of things happened, but uh, those who were mobilizing to address black infant, infant mortality felt stuck. Uh, that was one of the observations. And that certainly wasn't uh, on their own. Uh, there were a lot of forces at work to keep uh, the black infant mortality and white infant mortality rates uh, disparate. And so it's just important. You know, for me, this is a more recent example uh, where I can uh, draw upon to say when we get stuck, there are, are actually costs to human lives. Uh, it is not just our own, right? We are in service of our communities. Uh, and so our own stuckness has, um, uh, I'm, I'm just reminded of the, uh, of, of the human life cost when we are uh, trying to figure it out. Um, so last, uh, last on this uh, you know, uh, idea of stuck is I actually don't like the stuck metaphor. Uh, and I don't like the stuck metaphors because it's, it's a machine metaphor, right? And we all know we are human beings. We are living systems. Our organizations are living systems. And I actually think that the more we apply living systems metaphors, it helps us uh, get different information. It helps us know what, to, you know what we're looking at and how to assess differently and potentially better than applying uh, machine metaphors. Uh, but on to uh, conversation about assessment. I'm going to pass it to my colleague, Michelle. Hi, folks. Thanks, Teek. Thanks to all of you for being here. Super excited to be with you all in community and with my amazing OE team. Um, so as Teek mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, assessment. And, you know, I've been doing this sort of data research piece of the equity journey for a long time. And I've looked at it from all sorts of different angles. Um, so, you know, what does equity look like in organizations and how do we actually measure that, right? What are clever ways to get at what equity looks like? What does inequity look like? And how does it show up again, um, you know, from a data perspective? And what does data look like when it's inequitable or when there's inequity in a space? And so there are, I think, a lot of different ways to slice and dice it. Um, but in the end, for me, equity is when you cannot predict someone's outcomes by virtue of their demographic characteristics, right? So when their experiences, whether they are positive, whether they are negative, whether they are challenges, um, that those experiences within a system occur independent of your race, independent of your gender identity, independent of your neurotypicality and all the intersections that come in between. And so um, to that effect, uh, you know, I am, a, I am a data sort of nut, if you will. Um, and I, I, I do love a big data set. But when you do this work, I really think you need to be clear about what kind of data you want, um, what you need and how to interpret it. And so I'd just like to offer three sort of takeaways to sort of think about in the context of assessment. Um, so all of my colleagues have touched on this idea of intel, information, awareness, and really it's always about being data-driven, right? We are such um, we're such contextual beings, and so we really have to have an understanding of where we are. And so to Jasmine's point, you need to know where you are and how far you're willing to go. And ultimately, you have to know what that looks like, right? And that does really translate into data. Um, so the only way to sort of plot your course is to figure out where you are, to figure out what that end state or midpoint state looks like, and then try and backwards map how you get there. The other uh, point, so another point beyond being data-driven, is um, to not get swayed by small numbers. Um, small numbers are... Uh, sometimes folks think, well, you know, 
when I look at a data set, if I look at how um, people are feeling in the context of an organization, well, you know, 97% of folks are happy or they're endorsing an organization. Well, that may be true. And it's sometimes tempting to think, okay, well, we must be doing all, all right. Okay, only, only, only a few people are either unhappy or experiencing this challenging outcome. But the reality is that equity is in the margins, right? So if that organization, you take a step back and you look at, well, who is it that's endorsing the organization? Who is it that's experiencing the positive versus the um, negative outcomes? If those 3% of folks who are having those um, marginalized experiences are folks that don't fit into that uh, dominant culture box, then you have a clue that things are not necessarily um, going, going well, right? And so there is this um, temptation sometimes to look at at data and think only about the numbers and that small numbers are somehow easily dismissed. And I would argue that that's a real, um, that's a, that's a real fallacy because again, oftentimes you need to look at the margins to figure out what's going on with equity. And so that leads me to sort of my third point, which is really the importance of qualitative data, right? So stories and lived experiences are supremely important. You know, there's a long tradition of dominant cultures using numbers, you know, numbers equals science equals truth. Okay, but using small numbers is also an excuse right? It can be an excuse to exclude or to hide the experience of those who are in the margin. And so if you want to understand what is going on, I think it's really critical and we at Community Science really believe in this sort of quantitative and also qualitative piece so that you can get the whole story for everyone and you can figure out who, for whom are things working and for whom are things not working? And that becomes a clue as to where you might need to drill down in terms of some of your change efforts. And so with that, I'll go ahead and pause and send it back to you. That's really, if that's great, and we're already hearing from you online, I'd love it. Okay, st stuck, taken care, I'm not stuck. We're ready to move forward. Resistance, got it. Uh, and we'll come back to that. There's a question of what if someone doesn't want to come to the table? By thinking about, Jasmine, what you were saying, like how far do you want to go? And is the pace of change what makes sense for your organization? And how far depends on your context. Are you a government organization? Or are you a nonprofit? Do you have the resources and staff capacity to do that? And Michelle, what I loved you saying is the data helps you decide that priority. Well, so once you say yes, we want this desired state to advance equity in our organization and community. Where, for who, and where Where should we start first, right? And then take what I hear with you is just try it. Once you get that priority and that first step after you back march, backward map, try it, see what happens. And if you get stuck, learn from that. And so what folks are really interested in is like, okay, now what? What does that strategy look like to help us move through? What are those critical conditions I should be looking for in my organization, my leadership team and our culture, right? So uh, if you don't mind starting us off, Teek, what are some of the barriers and facilitators when designing uh, an equitable change system to get some an organization or supporting that driver from that current state to that desired state that only that organization can work towards? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll start with the... Um facilitators, uh, I think of uh, what's what's primary in uh, in every effort, no matter the context, is, uh, is a process of mobilizing, is a process of growing, who is actually uh, in the effort with you. Uh, always anticipating there will be um, uh, barriers and challenges, right? There, are, there, are, there always will be moments when you are um, uh, experiencing the resistance, but uh, mapping, you know, getting concrete about who's, who is uh, on board with whatever effort, right? And getting, um, you know, the, the, in, in a way, moving beyond being stuck can mean adding one, right? One more person or taking one step. I think often when we are uh, feeling like, uh, um, you know, where we don't know where to go next, um, it's because we, we we're holding potentially too tightly onto the end goal. Uh, and we're not uh, opening ourselves up to to the feedback that we're getting. Um, so thinking of the uh, thinking of that, and then in terms of inhibitors, um, one one can be uh, thinking about the uh, you know, holding onto the goal too tightly. Uh, another one that comes to mind is um, is uh, 
uh, operating with the same kind of infrastructure that you've had throughout the process, meaning like that an organization had been going, then you bring in an equity initiative, and then we're still trying to operate with the same uh, the same structure, the same feedback loops, which are uh, uh, which need to be significantly expanded uh, when you are doing an equity initiative because there's just so much more you're trying to take in as you're trying to um, move the work forward. With those infrastructure considerations, Jasmine, what, what, what folks are really wanting to know is how do you keep leadership at the table, right? What are the facilitators and the barriers you've seen when working uh, with organizations when a leader's like, that's that inequity is not there, or I, this conflict doesn't make sense, or even Michelle, when, when uh, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, like what data really moves uh, a leadership team to take action? So Jasmine, I was wondering if you can open us up. Same question, but kind of weaving in, knowing sometimes there's a difference of piecing and, and how far people want to push when you're designing this, your organizational right. change. Right. So knowing how far we want to push, right? Leaders at the table. Is that what I hear you saying, Amber? If they're not at the table. They're not wanting to come to the table. Um, here's the thing, the, this process, in my experience, it can only uh, move at the pace of how fast leadership or how far leadership is willing to go. So what I would say is oftentimes when leaders are not necessarily fully on board or they're like, mm, that sounds good. Maybe, maybe it sounds good. Maybe it's good for business. Maybe it's not whatever it is. It sounds good. They're a little weary of it start from where they where they are right so it's not necessarily making them uncomfortable not I mean comfortable with the idea of staying uh, maintaining the status quo or maintaining the current state right but it's saying okay what step are you willing to take right now can we both agree in my experience it's, e it's much easier in this work to start from a place of agreement Right. So if they're even willing to have the conversation, where can you agree? So now we both agree we want to move and have an equitable change uh, process inside of this organization. Boom. OK, we both we can both agree there. All right. How far like what can we do? Right. Offer something, offer a, a step. Right. Because at the point uh, based off what Teach said and in our experience, the point is to move. Right. I would challenge you all not to be for you all not to become stuck because of someone else's reaction. We have to also understand that everyone is in a different place. As Amber mentioned earlier about the roots and how the roots are connected and that people make up these organizations, we have to realize that we're not robotic, that we have fears, we have all these things. And so having those conversations, particularly in the planning phase of your, um, your this process is really important. It's not saying that they're not going to move, but it's time, y'all. I, I cannot say that enough. You have to invest time in planning to bring people to the table. There are le The leader has to be brought in, right? Depend what you're doing. In cases, HR, maybe for nonprofit, it's the board. There are pieces, there are people that are necessary to have bought into this process. Now, there's a difference between being bought in and saying, hey, I'm, I'm with you. We can move forward and saying, hey, I'm where you are. Those are two different things. What I would challenge uh, you all to do in those situations is not to other, right? So if we stop and we say, oh, this leader does not want to do this. Then we stop all movement, all progress, and we will never go anywhere. And to Teek's point, who benefits from that? is working as as intended right who benefits from that and then who loses right who's impacted by that so being willing to meet people where they are being willing to have conversations being willing to have the difficult and uncomfortable conversations and asking clarifying questions what is it about this step what is it about this strategy that makes you uncomfortable being very explicit and being comfortable and standing saying we really need to know because you've already said you've agreed to go up on this journey so the accountability is to the organization and to the people within it because if we do not move then now we've done harm and then what are the implications of that what makes the thread between uh you and teak Jasmine is really 
getting the planning phase is to get clear on what your organization can change, right? That's where everyone's great. We're here because of the mission. And we notice that there's a uh, constituents we're not serving, right? And then often when we're working with the senior leadership teams, like, ah, but it's a hundred percent that needs to be bought in. That's when the pause is wondering like, well, have there been other initiatives that maybe aren't explicitly equity that you moved forward where there wasn't a hundred percent buy-in yet you still did it and moved, kept momentum forward. So the reason why we're saying move forward because there's a headwind. And sometimes that headwind is your dog. So there's a headwind preventing you from doing your work. And so in those moments, the literature and change management shows that there's 80%, you need 80% buy-in. And so what narrative do you want to feed? You could spend 80% of your investments and times and resources to the 20% that uh, maybe aren't ready to change, need to understand more, or just to disagree. Or you could spend 80% of your money on the 80% to find more commonalities, right? And so then Michelle, it makes me wonder, so in those meetings, when you're working with a board or, there's, or a senior leadership team, again, that's like, well, we need all or nothing. What, what are you thinking about? So going back to the conditions. So we heard, who's at the table? What leaders are at the table that are bought into where you want to go? Maybe not uh, the actual behaviors yet, but everyone is there because they want to see that desired state happen. We've heard, how do we keep momentum and finding the small wins while still having space for people to ask questions and keep learning, right? But then we're all, there's a balance. So it's not at the harm of those that, where could we keep going, right? What are the little pockets that we keep moving forward? Michelle, what I love that you were opening up with is the different data to help find the hot spots or maybe even put some little bread seeds along the pathway to see where to move forward. Do you mind sharing some thoughts? Yeah. I mean, so it 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 reckons back to that question of, you know, what moves people, right? And I think that it depends, you, you know, I'm a big context person. So different folks are moved by different things, but I'll uh I'll quote Jasmine here, this is human work, right? And it is relational work. And I actually have found that you can be uh, very quantitatively oriented, but what often changes or can move someone are the stories, right? That those human connections, those human stories, these lived experiences that people are having. And once folks you know, it's a bit of a cliche, but this, you know, this is not just a number. These are human beings that you have connection with, that you are in community with in your organization and knowing a little bit more about the experiences that they're having um, can sometimes really be the, the, the switch, if you will. You know, I've been, um, I've worked with some organizations one example comes to mind, it was a particularly, I will just say conservative organization. And um, to the point where it was even challenging to use the word diversity in the context of a conversation. It was that kind of like, <clears throat> you know, um, scary for them. And it turned out that a leader was willing to share a story about um her her child who belonged to a uh, uh, you know a marginalized population and particularly in that their context, and somehow she shared how that just it softened everyone. Like here's this person I have a relationship with, I I I connect with them, and now I understand that it's not just about politics, but this these are real stories, and so I think that that is the power of. Humanity. I think that's the power of when we think about different kinds of data. Yes, you want the numbers, but you also want that qualitative story, those lived experiences, because that's where you can get the connection. The other thing I wanted to just um, pick up on, it's a bit tangential, but Jasmine, you were talking about sort of slowing down. One of the things that we notice sometimes, I mean, I I, I could not agree more. There is no one and done. This like if you're looking for it, it's, it's not going to work. <laughs> it's just not going to work. But when you slow down and you start to implement these um, change efforts, when you're looking at the data, oftentimes, and this gets scary for folks, things look like they get worse before they get better, 
right? And people are like, it's not working, it's not working, we're making it worse, we're stirring the pot, right? This kind of idea of like, let's, let's, let's back away, right? We're, we're somehow stirring the demons. And it actually turns out that's pretty common. And sometimes when things get worse, it's because folks feel freer to report. Folks feel freer because they see themselves. They're like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that was a thing. And that that's happening to other people. Well, let me speak up about it, right? So oftentimes, even in the context of looking at data, whether it's the lived experience, sort of more qualitative or it's the quantitative, we see weird blips and it, it can sort of spook people, if you will. It's pretty common, actually, to see things get worse before they get better. You know, there is there is darkness right before the dawn, and there is a reason for that. And it's generally a good sign that that you are you are close to a turning point. So just another offering. And just to build on that, I just want to uh, note that um, in my own experience, but also as I look at, you know, I'm, 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 you know I talk about living systems a lot, but I, I'm, I'm I'm new to gardening. But when I think of my own growth, but also when I look at plants grow or just like, um, it's not pretty, you know, like it takes a while for something to grow and get pretty, right? Like when I'm growing or in some new new cycle, like I, it's it's totally bewildering. So just your point about like, uh, it can get feel worse, but it's just, it, it can just be different than what we're used to. And if we can make it through that really difficult, you know, uh, um, period, uh, that's a tough period to get through, I think, in these change processes. Um, but uh, but if we can get through it, then then we can uh, you know get to the to to where we are feeling. Oh, this actually does potentially feel better too. What I also hear is what are the data, right? How what are we monitoring for progress? A different way to hear to hear the data because I, I I know the project Michelle is talking about, and really it gets to the different pieces. It's not just one component at a time, right? It's a leader that understands and a leadership team. We're going to focus on staff retention, working with the HR department and saying, great, now people feel more comfortable going to HR. We might see a spike in saying, I, I don't feel like I have career trajectory. My boss is not clear. I'm getting microaggressions and it's from these people, right? Uh, it's it's typically from this, this band of managers. Boom. One, you get a hot spot right, of, oh, there's a potential intervention. What? How are managers equipped and change management informed in real time and skilled to have conversations across race, across gender, geography, class, all the generational, right? It's a band that's forgotten. At the same time, because you're seeing your numbers go up in HR, that's a positive indicator. It's that people feel comfortable speaking up. Right. So that's that getting ready phase. Now, sustaining is what do you do next? And that's why we're saying, how do you keep moving forward? So what do you do next is what's the next version and how responding. Right. To, oh, we're seeing elevated complaints around microaggressions. Right. The intervention might be getting feedback and hearing what the issues are and getting specific which group might need training or in their job description, different behaviors to see. Right. So then that next iteration might we might see numbers the same or go down, but more people getting promoted within or speaking up in meetings. We've seen in the business literature that it also facilitates increased innovation and your ability to reach out. We also have folks, um, panelists, I'm interested to hear your thoughts. We got we got a lot of things coming in. So we have a couple. One is how is the equitable change process different than any other change? And I wonder, like, Teek, if you had some thoughts, because I know really change is change. It's the word equity that might make it feel so different. But I'd like yeah. to hear your thoughts. Of, is it different? No, I think it is different. <laughs> I don't think change is change. So um, it is important to think about, like, we are placing equity as this transformational proposition um, where you are, you know, from something to something else. But that is different than something that is more developmental. Right. There's developmental change, which is a different uh, process, um, you know, and so like to understand like, oh, are, are we actually in a transformation process is a really important question. And this goes back to what Jasmine was saying earlier, which relates to how far do you want to go? Um, it, it, uh, equity is the way we see it here. Um, is about this, this really this this capacity to be something different, but also we add on 
it's not just doing something different. It's actually growing your capacity as you're doing, it, right? Um, it's actually being more capable. You know, hopefully as you transform, you can, you can, um, the organizations you're working with are actually capable of solving bigger problems, right? This is not just about, you know, for, for the sake of change. This is about actually creating organizations that are uh, places where there is more, you know, uh, humanity actually than out going out into the world and accomplishing more goals, you know, bigger goals, um, creating more impact and uh, and accomplishing our missions in different ways. So I do think it's a there there is all change is not the same. Would you say there's certain things that are true? Like you have to find a priority, you have to resource that priority, right? And this is where it's like urgent in a way. Like that's the one priority you you're, you're focused on. So as other ebbs and flow happen in the organization and externally, there are some steps that are the same on how you change a state. And would you say think, equity? So why does equity make it feel so different when you put the word equitable in front of it? So I just want to push back a little bit. Yeah. There's some steps yeah, that are there. the same. Yes. <laughs> right. And yeah. otherwise I'm like, oh my goodness, if this, this is different and it might be a way to stay stuck. Yeah. So no, I, I think there are. Yeah, a little bit yeah sure. No, I do think like uh, everything we know about uh, about leading through change is applicable, right? And I do think that uh, the cycles that I, I've been a part of, that we see uh, organizations all around the, you know, that, that we work with, um, it requires more of us because we are uh, reclaiming uh, parts of our individual selves and the the this uh, this commitment to equity, which is um, a, a discovery process along the way, you actually don't know what your next step is until you take the step, right? So this is uh, one of these metaphors of uh, when you're when you're in the dark and you're lost, is you you take your journeys as you know, following the next step, and then reassessing, and then moving forward, right? Um, and so we are learning very new behaviors as we're taking all these steps. So if we're learning how to engage with ourselves. How do I na navigate this step differently? How do I engage with others differently? Right. So there, there are, uh, you know, there's lots of different examples of organizations doing this, and everyone needs to do it according to their own context. Right. Everybody's engaging with their, you know, the the culture of their own organizations, the people there. Uh, which I do think is both. You know, so there's both absolutely consistencies, and there's, um, you know your journey is gonna be different from uh, the organization next door. Well, I love what, I totally appreciate what you're saying, how some parts are different. And what I really heard you saying, some behaviors, right? So if it's like any organizational change, it is status quo. We know this, this is the flow of the steps. There's some input, what perhaps on open to strong pivots, when equitable is put in front of equitable organizational change, what I hear you saying is, the steps might be similar, but knowing how to, the behaviors needed is new. You may not be the expert and that feels not good, right? Most of us are trained to be the experts. We know the answer and then we, and then we go. But sometimes it requires pause. Do we need more resources? Or there's someone else that's an expert in the room that I'm not used to listening to. And then I need to do my work to be like, it's not me to lead this, it's someone else, right? So getting really clear, on what's different. That's, I just was picking up that thread you're saying. So yes, there's the flow and it's the different behaviors, the unknown that you're not used to reaching for as an expert that makes it feel dangerous, risky, or cautious because that calculation that you might make as a manager, as a leader, or a staff member, it's, it's a little bit harder to calculate. Like what is the risk? This is new, this is uncharted territory. Jasmine, we, we're hearing a lot like, okay, y'all are talking about the organization, line up that mission, good to go. There's a roadmap. Michelle's telling me about getting the mixed methods in there, make sure there's qualitative. But this organization also exists in a community. So how does the organization and in partnership or in a dance with the community influence an org? And there's another question that that's in there. I think it's important to say, and how, how is it not always manipulating the sad stories, right? mainly of people of color, marginalized identities to get an organization to act. So I was wondering if you could share a few thoughts on that. Oh, that last question. I felt that emotional Ooh. labor invoice right in the gut. I felt it. I felt it. <laughs> right. Um, yes. Yeah, so communities influence on the, the organization itself. Listen, are you li living into the values that you set forth for the community? Are you leaning into those? Right. 
the community should matter like in this in this process are they included in this matter are they do they have a decision making process are you sharing information back with them are you asking them back to my 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 favorite question or my favorite statement i don't want to be right i just want to get it right i think to amber's point that we are oriented to being experts right and to the point about the lived experience you also have to earn the right to even receive those stories you have to earn the right to receive those stories. I'm gonna say that again. You need to earn the right to receive those stories because I do not owe you my pain. I do not owe you my story. And if you, like inside of your, your change process, how are you engaging with community, right? What steps are you taking? What are you offering? Or are you sitting in what has traditionally been done, right? And we, if you, went to university, you've done any, ever done any kind of community participatory research, you go to the door, you go to the neighborhood, you have the university shirt on, they're like, don't wear this shirt, don't wear it out there, because people are tired, okay? So again, the biggest thing about the community's influence on the organization is that you all, the organization has to be willing to receive the community as experts of their experiences experts and how they've been impacted and also a source of the solution. Often we are very prescriptive, right? So to me, it's no different. The organization, again, is made up of people, right? So it's no different inside of an organization is a system. It's just a closed system versus the community is sitting in. It's the same thing. Don't do things to people, you do things with people. You make a decision, you share how you got there. Did we get it right? This is the data we collected. I went and got data from you. Hey, we see now based off the data, we know where there is smoke, where there is fire and where that is, where it's smoldering, right? Where, you know what, that's piping down. But because we see these hot spots, we see these things rising up. Community, how we think this, what do you think? Again, the, to uh, Teet's point, I mean, Amber's point earlier about equitable change, again, equitable change, being transparent, doing things with people instead of to people challenges power dynamics, okay? It interrupts power, okay? We haven't said power on the call yet, but people tend to look at power like a piece of pizza. There are only so many slices. If I take one, that means I'm not going to have a piece right? But we're sharing power. It, again, because we are respecting the stories and the experiences of those who are impacted by whatever system. So inside of an organization, it are the, it's the systems and the policies and the procedures. Inside of the community, it is the, it are, well, they're the systems that they interact with every day, whether it be public service, whether it be education, whether it be anything. It is the same thing. It takes time. There are conversations. You need buy-in. Again, respecting lived experience. Are you going to um, Miss Annie on the corner that's the candy lady that may not technically have power the way we receive power, but she is a go-to person in the community and you need her buy-in. So again, for us that are, you know, Going along this journey, I ask us to challenge our own assumptions. What's in your soil? What's feeding your plant? What mental models are you carrying that you cannot lean into that process, that you will not uh, take the time to actually be in relationship, be in community? And to, to Michelle's point, again, they're human. Treat others the way you would like to be treated. And that, what I what I appreciate what you're saying there is how is the community creating the demand? But if the organization's not ready to hear the demand, the the impact, the delivery on mission is never going to be fully realized. And so part of that is that new muscle that Teek was saying. And we also have a question about incremental change. Is is that equitable? Does that get you to equity or does it keep you in the middle? Right. And it makes me think about Teek's muscle. I saw you jump on, you have thoughts. Yes. Yeah, so, well, then the, okay. The, the small yeah, one. I just saw it. I was like, bring it. <laughs> the incremental change. Normally people look at the, in, the small wins and like, oh no, that's just the low hanging fruit. It takes low. You have to get the small wins to lead to the bigger win. As long as it's in alignment and it makes sense for the pacing, right? 
to how fast you're able to go this for the speed of change right and it is on par with where that ultimate destination that there there's nothing wrong with small wins and people need that y'all we live let's be honest we live in the age of social media I can just listen to a book. It's instant gratification. You have to have something to keep people going and then say, this is how this small change, this this incremental change gets us to this big one. And the point is to keep one, keep moving one foot in front of the, no, the other. So this is, now that we've done this, this is the next step. I'm sorry, T, go ahead, T. No, don't, don't be sorry. That's great. No, it's just gonna say like, uh, this is one of the things that I feel like I, I tried to become good at which is seeing as small of a change as, as possible and then sharing that out because it just everything just uh, what you're saying jasmine it, we have to keep feeding our team like yes we are making progress when we are when we're not right we need to be straight about that but can we all get really good at noticing the smallest level of change and keep using that to reinforce and, and get more people around and just knowing the time man it really flew so uh team I'm going to ask you what's what's two or three words that keep you hopeful and moving forward. And for those that have stayed with us, uh, we we try to answer all your questions. We will curate those and and find a correspondence back. I'm also talking to give my team a moment because they didn't know this question was coming to them. Uh, but Michelle, would you like to kick us off? What 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 gives you hope to keep keep going, keep the inertia moving forward? Yeah. So. I'd say community such as these, where everybody is working together towards, you know, transformation. And you said two words. So community and small change, because you can only get to big change if you go through the small. So that's my hyphenated word, small changes. I see a smile, therefore, take you have to go next. No, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm terrible at <laughs> two to three words. I need phrase. So, um, uh, you, yeah, please I proceed can't. with your phrases. Uh, no, I, I, I mean it though. Like I talk about the living system, but I, it is so important that we are feeding off nature, right? Uh, and that we are not just looking to the work in our workplace to feed us, right? Like, yep, do your work and surround yourself with sources that are going to keep you in this work. And so for me, it is nature. It is also music. Uh, and, uh, and then I, I love, um, just that I, I do, I believe anytime people are coming together like this, it is motivating. So, uh, stay connected to other people. Jasmine, do you have yes. some thoughts? Yes. Necessary good trouble. That is what keeps me here. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you again so much, everyone. And for those, you know, if we didn't get to all the questions, that's okay. We have another go next week with some practitioners. There's a question uh, that we really, I really wanted to get to about how de uh, leaders use data to tell a story, maybe not the story or stories others are seeing. And so Perhaps we could pose that to this panel. Again, we'll try, we'll share out these slides. We'll look at the questions. And if you ever want to connect with us, please, please um, reach out, send us feedback, or let us know what you want us to talk about the next webinar. We want to design these for you and keep this community going. So have a wonderful day and thank you.